So, what I want to do first is tell you what 1 John is about. Um, some of you like to take, make mental notes. Some of you uh, like to actually be very systematic in the way that you do things. I have bad news for you. If you are a very organized, systematic type person, raise your hand if you are an organized, systematic type of person. Okay? Raise a hand, keep it up high like you're proud of it. Not ashamed, proud of it. Okay? You know, you like to be, but sometimes you're not. Okay? Um, John, not. Okay? John is like a slinky. He just goes around and around and around, and you never know exactly what topic he's on because he's talking about one thing, and then all of a sudden, ooh, I had a brain th brainstorm. And then he goes off on this tangent. And then, just like I did in the reading, he's like, ooh, let's get back to that original thought because that's a really cool one, and I want to finish it. And I'll tell you more about that later, and let's get back to this because God's love is amazing, but got to enjoy the fellowship of the saints because that's really cool. And let's stay away from sin. And did I tell you about love? That God loves us? And that he brings us together in fellowship? And did I tell you not to sin? Because I don't want you to sin. Because God loves you. And he really loves you. And, and when he loves you and forgives your sin, he brings you into fellowship. And when he brings you into fellowship, it's going to make you not want to sin anymore. Okay? And making you not want to sin anymore is going to bring you into greater fellowship. Because it all goes back to his love. All right? There's the book of John. Okay? So, if you like that type of thing, you're going to love this. If you are used to my preaching, you're already prepared for this. Um, because I can tend to do that from time to time. I'm like, I have these things, thoughts, and brainstorms, and, and sometimes it was in my preparation, and sometimes it wasn't, and, and that's kind of what John does. So, John has four things that I'm going to share with you that you're going to get over and over again. Now, is repetition bad? No. Teachers, is repetition a bad thing? No. Is it a necessary thing? Yes. Oh my goodness. Parents, huh. <laughs> repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, trainers, Repetition, repetition, repetition. They even call it reps. I mean, it's just what we do. Repetition is a really good thing. So John likes to hit something, leave it, do something different, come back to it, leave it, leave it, do something different, come back to it, and you're going to get lots of repetition, and it's going to be extremely practical, and I believe all of it kind of stems around four areas, and we're just going to look at how these first four verses kind of relate to that. So, area number one, if you're making mental notes, or if you're actually making notes, um, and it really, I believe, will help you read through the book of First John. So if you know these four things and you're looking for them, it's going to make a difference in how God reveals himself to you in this book. Uh, the very first one, areas of emphasis, I guess you could call it, or, or major themes that you're going to find in 1 John, uh, things that he is passionate about that he covers. Number one, there's a strong theological component, all right? It deals with truth. John was combating something, and I'm going to explain that in a minute in more detail. So see there, that's what I do. I say something, and then I'm going to leave it, and I'll come back to it, um, because John does that too. So number one is theological. John wants to make sure that we know the truth, very specifically, the truth about Jesus. Not the truth about every aspect of doctrine and life, but he wants to make sure that we know who Jesus is is. We see that loud and clear in the first four verses. So the first is a theological, um, you could say, emphasis. The second, we could call it ethical. This just relates to life, uh, morality, how we live. It deals with things like love. It deals with things like sin. It deals with things like forgiveness. It deals with the everyday life of a follower of Jesus Christ. So he, he leaves that ethereal truth, knowing the truth, and then he takes it into a very practical, ethical 
look at how that affects our lives. The third area of emphasis after the theological truth, the practical life, the third area of emphasis is John is extremely pastoral. You just find that in the way that he writes. Um, this is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. We believe John wrote the Gospel of John and he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. You actually, if you read them side by side, you see so many similar characteristics. It's hard to believe anyone ever actually thought that he didn't write this. There's scholars who believe different things. There's always skeptics. There's always people that say something different. But from all practical purposes, uh, John the Apostle, the disciple, wrote the Gospel of John and also this. And he's extremely loving and pastoral. He's all about the fellowship of the body. He wants the church to come together and be united, to be one in heart and one in mind. And so we're going to see that pastoral emphasis and this focus on fellowship. In fact, we saw that again in verses 1 through 4. So we have theological, and then we've got kind of ethical, dealing with life, and then we've got pastoral. And then the, the final component, and we really see it here also in verses 1 through 4, and this to me, I just added it because I didn't want three. Um, because that's so cliche-ish, and I thought we needed a fourth. There's a strong um, personal component. So not only is he pastoral in speaking to the church, the body about fellowship, he's also very personal. And you see that at the very end here. We're writing these things so that our joy, some translations have your joy. We don't know which. It could be both. Um, so that your joy and our joy might be complete. He's very personal and he wants you to experience this because he knows it's the greatest thing there is. So let's look at these four verses. I'm uh, going to do this pretty simply and we'll see the theological, we'll see a little bit of the ethical, we'll see a little bit of the pastoral, we'll see a little bit of the personal and then if you read 1 John with those four thoughts in mind, you're going you're gonna to see how John keeps coming back to those four themes over and over. And sin falls in there. Love falls in there. Those are two huge emphases in the book of John. But this idea of fellowship falls in there too. So let's deal with the first one, okay? That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, it's possible without a background to, to read this and go, all right, so he's kind of wordy. <laughs> And John's just a little bit wordy. Why did he use those words? Why would he have said it that way? Why isn't there a greeting? Why doesn't he say, hi church, oh grace and peace be unto you. I love you guys. I pray for you all the time. And by the way, here's what I want to share with you. John does it differently. He cuts right to the chase and he jumps into the theological right off the bat. So verses 1 and 2 deal with the theological right off the bat. What was the background? Why did he do that? Um, have any of you ever heard of a thing called, excuse me, Gnosticism? Gnosticism. Gnosticism um, is basically something that was based on knowledge, but it was various heresies. Heresies are false beliefs about God um, and about Jesus. It was a, a form of heresy that goes back to biblical times. It's a form of heresy that's still around today. We just don't call it Gnosticism. Um, thing, every heresy was pretty much named after a person or a word. Uh, I think the word Gnosis is wisdom or knowledge, and that's why um, it, this is called Gnosticism. But then there's also things like do, Docetic Gnosticism, and that was named after someone who proposed this theory. And then there's another form of Gnosticism that John is dealing with here, and that's why he jumps out of the gate, and he has this theological beginning. 
So let's look at what Gnosticism was, specifically Docetic Gnosticism. Gnosticism elevated knowledge. Knowledge good, everything else bad. Okay? Docetic Gnosticism took that, and, and if knowledge is good and everything else is bad, Gnosticism would say, anything spiritual is good, anything physical is bad. Anything physical is bad. What do you all have? Do me a favor and do this. What do you see? A hand. A hand. And you have fingers on the hand, right? And it's connected to what? A wrist, which is connected to an arm. And what is this? Is it spiritual or is it physical? This is very physical. Okay? This is matter. So Gnosticism says knowledge and everything spiritual is good. This is bad. So Docetic Gnosticism took it a step further and said if everything that's physical or made of matter is bad and only that which is spiritual can be good, what do we do with Jesus? Because what was Jesus? He's both. I mean, he's God. But what did he put on? Flesh. <laughs> um, John wrote about that in the Gospel of John. That the word became flesh. And flesh to a docetic Gnostic is what? Bad. So therefore, um, there was this false view about Jesus. That Jesus was a phantom. Jesus was a ghost. Jesus didn't really exist. He was just a spirit and he kind of worked in this world and he was, he was kind of floating around, but he wasn't a real human being. So what are they denying when they've denied all of that about Jesus? They're denying a lot. Um, we talk a lot about the incarnation that God put flesh on and made his dwelling among us. And so docetic Gnosticism says nope because that was just this phantom spirit almost like a figment of our imagination. Maybe we, maybe we were a little bit um, I shouldn't even go there. Maybe we weren't quite in our senses and we thought we heard something or we thought we saw something but it's not really there. And this phantom spirit definitely didn't have a body. So if this phantom spirit didn't have a body, what did he not do at the end of his life? Die. Die. On a what, Brady? On a cross. So then what do we no longer have? Forgiveness of sins. We no longer have what we call the atonement. So these forms of Gnosticism were taking away the incarnation of Jesus. They're taking away the atonement of Jesus. And Jesus is now just this floating phantom spirit thing that's out there. Because according to Docetic Gnostics, everything of flesh is bad. Now, do we face Docetic Gnosticism in this day and age? No. No, in, our, in this day and age, what do we celebrate? The physical. We really face the other. Maybe we could learn something from the Docetic Gnostics. Maybe um, that we could apply to our lives today because we've just gone completely to the other end. And, and basically, if we can't see it, then we don't think it exists. Or it doesn't really matter to us. If it doesn't deal with my life, then who really cares? So we've kind of taken, and we have our new heresies in this day and age. But John was combating this now with this understanding that Jesus wasn't really real. He was this phantom spirit just floating around. Now listen to these words of John. That which was from the beginning. He says it was eternal. Which we have heard. Okay? And what do we hear? We hear with our ears and we hear noise. We hear um, sound. We hear these vibrations that are made. We hear those and discern those with our ears. And they have to come from a source. 
So that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes. It wasn't this floating spirit that no one could see. We saw Jesus. That which we have looked upon, and then I think here are some of the key words, and have touched with our hands. So John, right off the bat, is combating this heresy, and he's getting to the theological truth about Jesus. Because he wants his readers to know Jesus. We hear that in verses 1 through 4. He's shooting out of the water all of these lies that the false teachers are now spreading that Jesus is a phantom spirit who had no physical matter, no body, and therefore there was no atonement and there was no incarnation. He says, no, all of that's true. He wrote about that in his gospel. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And here he talks about the word as well. He says all of this is true. We've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The word of life there is logos. And logos was something every good Jew would know. But also something every good Greek would know. The logos. Um, every Jew would know it because that was um, God. The Logos, the Word. And then every good Greek would know it because even among paganism, there was this view that there was this Logos. There was this divine something out there. And so what John is doing is, is truly revealing what that Logos is. So he says, it was from the beginning. It's eternal. We've heard it. We've seen it with our eyes. We've looked upon it. We've touched it with our hands. Is, this is the Logos, the word of life. And then he goes into his little parenthetical aside. Oh, side note. The life was made manifest. Anyone know what it means just in an earthly sense? Um, today, in this day and age, do you know the definition of manifest? Not the TV show. No. Okay. The definition of manifest, what is it? Anybody know? Uh, in, in we think of that in an airplane manifest. That's kind of what that is based on. Um, anyone else? Okay, we're getting really close. Physical proof. Randy, is that a hand? That No, no, no. I'm lost. All right. I didn't know, I like, how often do you use manifest in a given week other than the TV show? Say, I haven't watched manifest and I never will. I mean, other than that, how often do you use manifest? It really means to be made evident, to be made apparent. It's factual proof. Yes. Did you find a definition, Mr. Brady? Clear or obvious to the eye or mind. He says, that life was made manifest. It was clear and it was obvious to our eyes and to our minds. It was apparent. It was obvious. It was right there in front of us. What is John also pointing out? really carefully in these words. Um, could any of us write this same intro, verse 1 of 1 John chapter 1? Okay, see this is where we go. Well, kind of. Have we seen him? We say yes, we've seen him. Have I seen his physical body manifested, made apparent before my very eyes in the room? No. But have I seen Jesus at work? Yes. See, we talk about him like he's a spirit phantom. Because now in this present day and age, the spirit is the spirit of Jesus moving in this world. We don't necessarily see him, but the true spirit of Jesus is there. And um, I, I just think it's really interesting. We also just celebrated communion. Have you ever touched Jesus? No. Have you not? Oh. 
Because we say when we take this, we're actually touching Jesus. So we would kind of understand in a spiritual sense this, but we can't write it the same way John did. He's not spiritualizing this. What is John saying? Three words. I was there. I was there. John is saying, I'm an eyewitness. I've seen it. I touched him. I heard him. I embraced him. I leaned up against him when he gave us the Last Supper. The, I leaned up against the body. I was there. I heard every word that he said. I walked life with him. You think he didn't exist? You're wrong. <laughs> Because I was there. Along with the other apostles. The other disciples. And so if you don't want to believe us. The ones who actually walked with him. You think it was a phantom spirit. You can believe the false teachers. Or you can listen to the guy that was actually there. Because they weren't. I was there. And Jesus was real. The life was made manifest. We have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made apparent or before our very eyes made obvious. It was made manifest to us. Then he goes under into verse 3. So we see that theological emphasis. Now we're going to get into um, the, some of the practical and the ethical. You're going to see that all over. It's going to be stronger later. Not so much in these first four verses. Um, but you see a small glimpse of it there too. He wants this to impact the way we live our lives. He doesn't want this knowledge to be heard and then not to be dealt with. He wants this to impact the way that we live our lives. So we get into verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Do you notice anything real quick? That you find interesting in the so that here? What do you notice? Let's actually put our brains to work. Let's really think about this. And, and do you find anything interesting? I find something pretty interesting here. Do you find anything interesting? Why does John want to proclaim this so that what? Oh, do we not have it up on the screen? Verse 3. Did we lose it? Y'all are like, I don't remember because I don't have a Bible and I'm not looking. Okay. What do you find interesting? Anything? You have any thoughts? It's okay for, it's not right and wrong. It's just something I find interesting. So there's no right and wrong. I find that interesting. That he, where does he start? So that your fellowship he doesn't start with Jesus, right? He says, so that your fellowship may be with us. Oh, and by the way, our fellowship is indeed with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So, he's saying that, but he starts with fellowship with us. Like, so that means that we would go out and we would say, oh, we want you to know about Jesus so you can hang out with us. Is that a great form of evangelism? No. Because why would I want to hang out with you? And why, they would look at, why, I don't want to hang out with you. And so I just find it kind of interesting here. But here's the beautiful part. We believe that God spoke this. God ordained this. God was speaking through John. There's something powerful about what we are here. And John knew that. He emphasized the church. He was all about the fellowship of believers. We saw that in the, okay, ethical. We're going to move past ethical now to pastoral. And he is about fellowship with each other and fellowship with God. And what does he want everyone to know by knowing the truth about Jesus? He wants them to have a relationship with Jesus. And how's that going to come about? Anybody? Where's it going to start? What you got, Luke? It's going to start with the church. It's going to start with us. Is it the church? Isn't that really cool? It's going to start with you. 
I love that John put that in there and he put it that way. Raise your hand if you have ever felt insignificant in a spiritual sense. Raise your hand, keep it up, if you have ever felt inadequate and I can't bring someone into the kingdom of God. Okay, I think every one of us has struggled with that at times. And John is saying, they don't come in through incredible arguments. That's not the way they come in. They don't come in through always or often through some sermon preached over the internet. Do you know how most people come into a relationship with Jesus Christ? Through a relationship with someone else. It's just beautiful how John wrote that. So I found it awkward and then as I really thought about it, I found it powerful. Because that speaks to us. God wants to use you to reach out to others so they might get to know you so that through you, they will get to know him. And that's just cool. That's part of the abiding, discipling, proclaiming. It's, it's all over that. You're going to hear a lot about abide, disciple, and proclaim as we look through 1 John. Because John is all about abiding, discipling, and proclaiming. And so I just think that's really neat. He talks about the body. He talks about the fellowship. He talks about the church. And he says, I'm testifying to these things. What we've seen. What we've touched with our own hands. We're proclaiming it to you so that you might have fellowship with us. That's where it's going to start. But that isn't where it's going to end. The goal is that you will have fellowship with the one that we have fellowship with. And that is God. And now, Let's think about that for just a moment. Is that pretty revelatory? I mean like you can have fellowship with God. Now for us we're like oh yeah I've heard that so many times. You say that all the time. It, it's kind of become not so fantastic. It's just the norm. But think how, about how beautiful this is. We get to have fellowship with the one who is eternal. And we get to have fellowship with the one who is made apparent to us as God revealed himself to us through the person of Jesus Christ. Because our, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Interesting that he points out very specifically now who we're talking about. Earlier it was the word and the word of life and this logos idea. Now John is identifying who the logos is it's Jesus Christ is how God has revealed himself to us. And we don't just get to have relationships that go this way. Okay? Um, we, we understand horizontal and relationships with other human beings. But we get to have a relationship that is with the God that created us. Which was mind blowing in that day and age. Especially for the Greeks who couldn't have that kind of a relationship with what they called their gods. And so he's very pastoral and he's writing about this fellowship and this unifying relationship that we can have with each other. And that's where it starts and that leads to a relationship that we can have with Jesus. And then he says, and we're writing these things so that our joy might be complete. Some translations again have your joy may be complete because when we experience fellowship fellowship with each other in the body of Christ and true fellowship with the God that created us the word of life who is eternal life we experience a joy that just starts to take over that's a very practical ethical part it's also a very personal part so already in verses 1 through 4 we see the theological we see the ethical we see the pastoral and we see the personal and what is the ultimate desire of John in these first four verses? How would you sum it up? What do you think? Got any thoughts, ideas, guesses? What are we going to leave with today? Say that again. Believe and fellowship with Jesus. Was that a hand back there? Did I see a hand go up or no? 
Was that a figment of my imagination, okay? Maybe it was. I see a hand right there. And it does. And we're going to get more and more into that. John gets more and more into that. Um, but right at the beginning, it doesn't even start with the obedience factor. We're going to get to that part. It starts with the relationship. The thing that John is passionate about. And the reason he's proclaiming the truth about Jesus, saying no, there was an incarnation and there was an atonement. It's all real. And he was a physical human being. I've seen him. I've touched him. It's because I want you to know him like I have come to know him. Is that the way we live our lives? Think about that for a minute. When you go to work tomorrow and we come into contact with other people and we don't know necessarily where they are in their faith, whether they're believers, unbelievers, uh, whether they're in Christ or not in Christ, is our desire the desire that John had, that they might know Jesus the way we do. I don't know that that's the burning desire that leads us and inspires us and motivates us every day. I think we are often challenged with that whole proclamation. And we kind of abide more by the, I love you, Jesus, and I believe in you, but I don't necessarily want to say anything to anyone else. And, and maybe I really love you and believe in you, but maybe I don't even fully believe it, or else I would share it more. And so John touches on the truth about who Jesus is first and foremost and that we can have a relationship with him and it starts with a relationship with one another. And so I just pray that we can kind of look at that and take that to heart and we can look at how that might relate to us or apply to us. The first John is going to be, it's an amazing book, beautiful book. I think it'll be very easy to understand and once we get past the, okay, he hops from this to this to this. And let's just focus on these four different specific emphasis. And the one here, he starts off, sure there's a theological component, but he's being very pastoral. He's saying, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know the God that made you. I want you to know the God that died for you. I want you to have a relationship with someone that you didn't think it was possible because you weren't good enough or you didn't know that that could happen. I want you to know Jesus and the truth about who he is.